Good morning and welcome to Community Bible Church. We're still working on getting all this electronic stuff to come together, but we'll get it done. Uh, COVID is going to make us better, stronger. We're going to start by singing Holy Ground, going right in to Holy Ground. It's our request that you would be with us wherever we are. Whenever we're listening to this, Lord, I pray for each and every member of the congregation that's unable to be here today. And I pray, Lord, that soon we will be able to come together in one spirit and with one faith and with one love. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we're going to sing, You Are My All in All. Jesus. 
second child. They asked that we would pray for them, and so we will do that for Eve and Cyprian Droma. We also wanted to uh, remember uh, the family of Jim Buckout. Jim, a wonderful friend and wonderful man of God, went home to be with the Lord. Uh, and so uh, I'll be having that funeral tomorrow. I pray that uh, God would be with me and uh, with the family. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that in trying and difficult days, you are God. We thank you, Lord, that you are our comfort, you're our strength, you're our everything. Lord, we pray for our world. Lord, our world that needs comfort more than ever. People, Lord, across our country that need hope and they don't have it. Oh God, we cast our cares on you knowing that you care for us. Lord, we pray that you'd be with Jim and with his family. What special, dear people they are. We thank you, Lord, that though he is absent from the body, he is present with you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for our faith that allows us to be strong in the midst of struggle. For every person, Lord, that has a request, they remain unspoken today, and yet as they whisper them before the throne of grace today, I agree with them in Jesus' name that you meet them where they are. May they be encouraged. May they be lifted up. May they find their hope in you. Help us to be more loving every day, every moment, with every interaction. Help us to treasure family to treasure the memories we're able to make today. Thank you, Lord, that we can cast all our cares on you. In the name of our Messiah, Jesus. Amen. Our sermon for today is found in Ezekiel. We're in Ezekiel today. We're going to be looking at uh, the first 14 verses. The first 14 verses of Ezekiel in a sermon entitled, Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley of bones, and they were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to those bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and you will make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. 
I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know I am the Lord. Then I will open your graves and bring them up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and what an interesting passage of scripture this is. Dry bones. So we pray today as we find ourselves in the midst of a difficult, dry, death valley of our own, facing trepidation and trial, alone, many of us, separated, quarantined. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us from your word. Your promises never fail. Hope is always found in you. Amen. Got to ask you a question today. What would be your dream job? Can you imagine, can you imagine working for the Queen of England? February 2018, Britain's royal family posted a job ad for a digital communications officer to manage the social media account for Queen Elizabeth II. For 38,000 US dollars a year, the digital communications officer will post articles, videos, photos about the Queen's state visits, Royal Business, she'll do that on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And the Queen has a worldwide following on social media, and she's got an image, as you might imagine, that she has to uphold. It would be a huge responsibility to be the spokesman for the Queen or any public figure. Now, what were the qualifications to get that job, you might ask? In addition to social media experience and a college degree, the royal job ad said the queen was looking for someone innovative with a creative flair who would do their job as part of a fast-paced and dynamic team. I have a question for you this morning. Do you think God chose Ezekiel to be his prophet to the nation of Israel because he was innovative and had a creative flair? I doubt it. I doubt it. God seems to choose his servants based on their obedience, not their skill set. And we know that Ezekiel wasn't part of the fast-paced and dynamic team. No, I, I gotta tell you, the job of a prophet is probably the loneliest job on earth. And if any of you are out there today, lonely, just think of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was not necessarily feeling the, like he had lots of company. He, he had a lonely job. The Harvard Business Review surveyed 1,600 workers to measure the levels of loneliness on the job. People who worked in law, engineering, and science reported the highest level of loneliness. But I bet uh, the Harvard Business Review did not include any profits in their survey because it has to be the number one loneliest job in history. In fact, if you were to, if you want to test my theory, then uh, this week, this week, you want to test my theory, try finishing every sentence with these words, in accordance with prophecy. 
in accordance with prophecy. I want, to, I want you to see how quickly people will want to punch you in the face, according to prophecy. Nobody wants to hear hard truths. Nobody wants to be told that they are sinful and rebellious and on the wrong side of God's will. There's no story about Moshe, a medieval Jewish astrologer who prophesied that the king's favorite horse would die soon. Sure enough, the, the horse died just a short time later, and the king got angry at Moshe, certain that the prophecy of Moshe had brought about that horse's death. And he summoned Moshe and commanded him, Prophet, tell me when you will die. Now Moshe realized that the king was planning to kill him immediately, no matter what answer he gave, and so he had to think and answer carefully. He said, I do not know when I will die. I only know that whenever I die, the king will die three days later. Now guess what? Moshe lived a long, long life. But prophets have one job, to speak for God, and sometimes God has some uncomfortable things to say to us. Pastor John Rittenbaugh says, when a person is freezing to death, he feels a pleasant numbness that he does not want to end. He just goes to sleep as he's freezing to death. But when heat is applied and the blood begins rushing into the affected areas, pain immediately happens. And though it hurts, the pain is indicative of the rescue and the cure. God sends a prophet to people who are cold in their relationship with God, spiritually freezing to death, though they seem to want to stay that way. The prophet turns the heat on. And they become angry with him when he is actually working to make them better. No matter where we are in our circumstances today, in the past or in the future, God is working in us to help make us better. So instead of viewing prophets as killjoys, why don't we look at prophets as symbols of hope? Because I'm going to tell you this morning, if God had given up on his people, he would not have sent a prophet. He's given up on them. Why would he send anybody if he'd given up on them? He sent a prophet. If God sends a prophet, it means there is still hope. So Ezekiel faced a difficult task because he was called to prophesy to the Jewish people at one of the lowest points in their history. You see, the small nation of Israel had been under siege, and finally they were conquered by the mighty army of Babylonia. Jerusalem lay in ruins. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Ezekiel, along with thousands of other Jews, was forced into exile to the capital city of Babylon, which was in modern-day Iraq. Can you imagine being a refugee, living in poverty in a strange land? Your center of worship has been destroyed. Your community has been scattered. Where is your family? Where are your neighbors? How do you rebuild your life when everything has been taken away from you? Their life was in their worship, their identity as God's chosen people. Did this mean that God had ended his covenant with the nation of Israel? Had the people lost their very identity as the people of the one true God? God sent Ezekiel. He sent Ezekiel to these desperate and broken people to answer that very question. Ezekiel 37 says, uh, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. So here we go, we've got Ezekiel, he's led by the Spirit, he's put into a valley, we're getting the picture here, and it is full of bones. Now this starts to get a little more interesting, he's in a valley, keep your eyes closed, I can just see it, in a valley, bones. All right, he led me back, Ezekiel says, and forth among the bones. Now watch him, he's walking back and forth on the bones. And 
And he says, I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. So I'm thinking it's not a rainy day that he's on those bones like it is today. They're dry bones. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy, prophesy to those bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I remember in Bible school, we used to sing, uh, hear the word of the Lord about the dry bones. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put my breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Try to get this picture. I mean, it'll get you out of wherever you are this morning, and see, this is high death reality Bible, right here in chapter 37 of Ezekiel. So he says, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded to me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are all dried up and our hope is gone and we're cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. And then you, my people, will know I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land, and then you will know that I am the Lord, and that I have spoken, and that I have done it, declares the Lord. You see, Ezekiel brought a word of hope in a hopeless time. And the Bible is filled, dear friends, with hope in the midst of difficult times. You may feel hopeless this morning. But our God is a God of hope. Ezekiel was an example of the hope that God sent to his people. In 1665, the bubonic plague swept through the city of London. And he wrote, Daniel Defoe wrote a book entitled The Journey of the Plague Year. And he described the devastation we would have seen if we had walked down the streets of London back then. People with the means to escape the city, they got out. Others barricaded themselves in their houses, afraid to go out. More than 1,500 people died each and every day. Bodies were piled up in open pits because there wasn't enough ground or enough grave diggers to give the dead a proper burial. Defoe writes that men roamed the streets, prophesying God's coming destruction on the city. One prophet wandered naked through the streets chanting, Oh, the great and dreadful God! Oh, the great and dreadful God! Now, is that what Ezekiel wanted to say in the Valley of Dry Bones? Oh, the great and dreadful God! Well, maybe so. It was a terrible time. But David Guzik in his Enduring Word Commentary writes that Jews insisted on a proper burial of their dead as a way to honor them. So an unburied body was a sign of shame, a sign of disgrace. So this was a time in the nation of Israel's history, a time full of fear, a time full of heartbreak, a time full of shame for the people of Israel. And then God asked Ezekiel the strangest question. God asks some strange questions sometimes. He asks Ezekiel this, Son of man, can these bones live? Why even ask the question at this point? Why, why does God try to interject hope in our most hopeless times? 
You want to know why? Because he loves us. He loves you and me. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, hid themselves from God? God used an animal fashioned clothes for them to cover their shame. When Abraham and Sarah reached their golden years without having children, God promised them a son and delivered to them Isaac. When Esther was a teenage bride in a foreign kingdom, God gave her the courage to stand up to a heartless king and save her people. You see, in hopeless situations, God keeps giving his people hope. So where is hope? Where is hope in the Valley of Dry Bones? Here we find hope. Here we find hope in a Valley of Dry Bones. God always keeps his promises. Here at church, God always keeps his promises. And so Ezekiel was confronted with a challenging situation. These weren't people with a future, these dry bone, not yet people, people. They were dry bones. And God is saying to Ezekiel to prophesy to them. As someone who is called to preach the word of God, I gotta tell you, it is hard enough to prophesy to living people. You may have a hard time believing this, but there are some hard-headed people in churches. And sometimes they don't want to listen to a word from the Lord. They don't want to love like they should. Why prophesy to dry bones? The power, you see, wasn't in Ezekiel's prophecy. The power was in Ezekiel's obedience. The power was in the promises of God. Ezekiel obeyed. God's promises were true. So Ezekiel begins to prophesy to the dry bones. And God begins to speak through him. God speaking through Ezekiel to bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life, and I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin, and I'll put breath in you, and you'll come to life. Then you will know I am the Lord. And at the sound of God's promises... These dry bones rose up from the valley floor and assembled themselves into skeletons and muscles and tendons and sinews and flesh covered these bones and they became bodies again. And God called the winds from the four corners of the earth to breathe into these bodies and those bodies came to life and stood on their feet and assembled themselves into a vast army. Not a crowd, not a mob, an army. An army has a purpose, an army has an allegiance, an army has a unity and power, a goal and a mission. And God explains to Ezekiel that this valley of dry bones represents the nation of Israel. They were dead, they were hopeless, they were cut off from the power of God. But they will not remain that way. No matter how circumstances look now, no matter what the history books or the politicians or the pundits say, listen to what the sovereign Lord God says. Through Ezekiel. My people, I'm going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you will my people will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, that I have done it, declares the Lord. God will keep his promises to them. But when did God first make those promises to the people of Israel? Way back in Genesis 12, way back in Genesis 12, when God told an old, childless man named Abram to leave his country and his people and go to a land where the Lord would show him. Faith is real. The Bible is filled with people who have done things that you'd say, why did he? I don't understand that. I'm having a hard time believing what you're talking, that this Ezekiel dry bone thing is true. But our reality is that we're in the faith business. 
We're in the God business. We're in the reality of seeing promises in the Word of God that are made real each and every day. So back in Genesis 12, this child, this man, is told to leave to a place God would show him. And this was God's promise that first gave life to the nation of Israel. What did God promise? God said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What was that last part? All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. How would that happen? When God sent his son, Jesus, through the lineage of Abraham and the nation of Israel to make a new covenant in his blood that would offer salvation and new life to all the peoples of the earth. That's why you and I are here today. We are part of the promise of God. On September 4th, 2012, Alex Sheen's father died. And most uh, people would describe uh, Alex's dad as an average man, but Alex described his dad this way. He was a man of his word. And at his father's funeral, Alex passed out small cards to everybody in attendance, and he called them promise cards. And at the bottom of each card were these words, because I said I would because I said I would. His father lived by those words. His father could be counted on always to keep his promises. And in honor of his father, Alex challenged everybody in attendance, and I challenge you this morning to write a promise on a card. He asked them to do it at the funeral on the card he'd given them. And to make a steadfast commitment to keep that promise. The people at Mr. Sheen's funeral were so inspired by Alex's promise cards that he began printing more and sending them for free to anyone who requested them. Today, Alex Sheen runs a nonprofit that does character education program in schools and colleges and prisons. He teaches about integrity and honor and character and, yes, keeping your promises. His organization has sent more than 11 million promise cards to people in over 150 countries. He also has a website, becauseisaidiwould.com, where people who have received a promise card can post their stories on the promises that they have made and kept. I'd like to share with you one of those, uh, the story of Elizabeth, 26-year-old nurse in the UK. Elizabeth works in an assisted living facility. She eats lunch every day with a particular patient who has dementia. Every day, at the end of their lunch, the woman would become afraid, afraid that Elizabeth would not come back to visit her. Her dementia made her forget how faithful Elizabeth was to her. So Elizabeth took a promise card. She took a promise card and wrote on it, I promise I will come and have lunch with you tomorrow. I promise that I will come and have lunch with you tomorrow. On a promise card. And at the bottom of the card were these words, because I said I would. And the next day when Elizabeth showed up for lunch, she found her friend clutching, clutching on that promise card. And she looked up and smiled and said, you remembered, God will never forget his promises. God will never forget his people. Across every page of the Bible, God writes his promises and signs every one of them with because I said I would. Listen to the promises that God made through Ezekiel to his people who were dead and hopeless and 
cut off. He'll give new life and new hope. He'll bring them back their homes and again put his spirit within them. He'll turn death into life. He'll turn a valley of dry bones into the army of God. How do we know? Because he said he would. Then you will know that I am the Lord, that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it. And as we move through this Easter season and this challenging time, remember that God is not done keeping his promises to his people. I will never leave you or forsake you, says the Lord. God is faithful. God's plans are eternal. And we, as God's people, can base our lives and our hope on the promises of God. I'm going to close this morning uh, with five promises that come from James McDonald's book, Always True. Five promises when life is hard. And so I want to share those promises with you as we end our service today and as you continue to move forward with this week of coronavirus all around us. The first promise is, God is always with me, I will not fear. God is always with me, I will not fear. Second, God is always in control, I will not doubt. God is always in control, I will not doubt. God is always good, I will not despair. God is always good, I will not despair. God is always watching, I will not falter. God is always watching, I will not falter. And number five, God is always victorious, I will not fail. No matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, remember, God is always victorious. And as a result of that, you will never fail. Father in heaven, we thank you for this passage of scripture. We pray, O oh God, today that you by your Holy Spirit would allow us to internalize it, to find hope in your promises. Thank you for being so good. In your name, amen. Our closing hymn today is, what number is it, Lucy? 705, 705 for those of you that have it at home. One of my favorites, it is well with my soul. I pray that's true for you today. When peace like a river
pray as we close out this service today. My prayer is for those that can't be here, for the embraces that we could not have for the sharing of requests that didn't happen. But Lord, you are with all of us. You've told us you'll never leave us or forsake us. And so Lord, as we enter this new week of hope and promise, during this time of difficulty, we pray that you would help us. And Lord, first and foremost in our minds, I pray that we would remember that you always keep your promises. As we think of that valley of dry bones and Ezekiel and that mighty army, thank you, O oh God, that you keep your promises. In Jesus' name, amen.